Hello, and welcome to the Argyle Financial Controller Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, and then we will turn the floor over to our esteemed opening keynote speaker. First, we would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors, Apsen and Bill. Our sponsors are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. We also welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active on social media, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us at, at Argyle Exec Forum. Also be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I would also like to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we have curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We have worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we truly appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most important, importantly, we would love to hear from you. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen. Following each presentation, we have set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. Thank you again for joining us. Now let's get started. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dan Johnson, Director of Content Accounting at Roku. We're excited to have Dan with us for his opening keynote titled, Generative AI Impact on Finance. Welcome, Dan, and over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks for this. I'm, I'm really excited to have a conversation with everyone today about generative AI and finance, and I, I think it's a timely conversation. So I wanted to kick off this presentation with a little taste of the creativity and productivity of AI. So, you know, take a look at this picture um, here. This picture was obviously developed by AI, but not only was it developed by AI, the concept of the picture was developed by AI. So um, what I did was I prompted AI that I had a presentation today about generative AI and the impact of finance. Please provide me with a image that would represent uh, a good start to this conversation. So the AI itself came up with this concept, and you can kind of see a, a you know robot with a finance outfit on. You have a mix of uh, old financial buildings and new financial buildings, different graphs to represent financial data. This is all things that could not have been done, you know, six months ago or a year ago, and so. Uh, you can tell, you know, there's a lot, long way to go with the technology. I think the image is a little bit too busy. There's things that I'd like to change about it, but we all see where it's going. Uh, you know, this is going to impact our our day-to-day -day lives. This is going to uh, impact our businesses. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited to have this conversation with, with everyone. And um, Andrew Ng, co-founder of and head of uh, Google Brain and esteemed... Uh, a lecturer at Stanford says AI is the new electricity. Um, it has the potential to transform every industry and create huge economic value. And you think about how electricity transformed the, the 20th century, um, you know, through transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, everything is, you know, has, has that impact of electricity. And if you think about or, um, you know, if your house, the electricity goes out or your business, the electricity goes out, we're kind of lost, right? And um, I think in the next couple of years, AI will have just as much impact and, and especially in the realm of finance and accounting. And so thanks again. I'm excited to be here. Um, most of my career has been in the entertainment and technology side. Um, but I've always been focused on innovation and and uh, productivity um, all the way back when I first started Disney and, and helped uh, start a lot of those RPA mechanisms and robotic you know, process automations back in the early 2000s. Uh, same at 20th Century Fox. I joined Netflix, which is an industry leader in machine learning. And now Roku thinking about you know, the next paradigm of, of uh, generative AI and how that impacts. So I'm excited to share a little bit in, about what I'm doing there, as well as giving you guys some practical um, advice on, on how to use the technology. So, um, you know, 
I'm sure everyone has heard about different technologies before that were going to change the world. And I think the the last one I can think about is, you know, 5G, you know, when I first read about it, you know, 5G would usher in self-driving cars and all these different uh, benefits that, you know, we haven't seen just yet. Um, but from my perspective, this is a little bit different. Uh, generative AI is uh, going to stay with us. It's it's not a fad, and and you know it's going to fundamentally change finance and accounting. Um, that being said, I wanted to put down the Gartner hype cycle. So Gartner does uh, show these hype cycles, and you know all technology follows these hype cycles at a period of time. Um, right now we probably are in the peak of inflated expectations, you know, next year, uh, the AI is not going to take over. And next year, we're not going to have a Terminator type solution or, 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 or future. So um, I think we're going to be at that peak of inflated expectations right now. And there's always going to be a trough of disillusionment where, you know, there might be people who kind of think about the technology and say like, well, it's pretty interesting. It's a, it's a useful tool, but um, but basically it's a chat bot or it, it doesn't really progress our business the way we thought it was going to be. And there's going to be this trough of disillusionment. But I'm here to encourage all, everyone on this call and encourage myself to use that time to get in front of the technology. We have a little bit of time to really learn and understand and figure out how to implement in our business. Um, and, you know, you can go to some of these conversations and, and I'm presenting today um, or, or take a class. Um, a lot of that, you know, you get, they say around when you do these classes, you retain about 5% of the information and hopefully it motivates you. But really, you got to jump in that pool and learn how to swim and play around with the technology on a day to day basis uh, in order to really progress your understanding of, of the technology. And but you know it's it, it's it's here to stay and it's going to impact you know the global economy in, in giant terms and here's a, an analysis by mckinsey showing just kind of how big it can impact the the global economy um so you know what is generative ai and generative ai is basically uses the entire corpus of the internet and all the information we have billions and trillions of documents in order to uh, inform the model in order to drive new content in the form of images, text, and audio. So it's really focused on like natural language and, and audio and text. And you can kind of think about how you can prompt it to write uh, a newsletter in the, the form of Shakespeare. I, I mean, you can write a song in the form of Drake, or it can kind of create new video uh, content. And so it's 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 really novel in that we haven't seen anything like this before. It's it's brand new. It's kind of built upon uh, the layers of you know seventy years of AI um, advancement. You know AI as a concept was only created seventy years ago at the Dartmouth uh, la um, summer program where they thought in 1953, 1956 that they could solve um, AI and, and artificial intelligence in a, in a summertime, that they could have a mathematical uh, emulation of human intelligence. And here we are 70 years later, nowhere near that. And so, you know, from there, you know, you built on the machine learning, deep learning neural networks, and now we have generative AI, which is the new paradigm. Um, and there's going to be anxiety. There's obviously anxiety about AI. And, and you know, I, I want to write here, you know, Probably AI won't take your job in the short term or middle term, but it's someone who's using AI that will uh, take your job. And you're going to think about it. I like to think about it as, as, you know, think about Excel and how much we use Excel on a daily basis, especially in accounting and finance. And, um, you know, 40 years ago, you know, there's probably people that took on Excel and learned it and we're able to do, you know, basic functions, addition, subtractions, multiplications, if you look up some things like that, and, and they're very much more productive at their jobs than they were before. But then, you know, the people who can kind of do hyper macros and coding and VBA, and they can kind of do magic in Excel. And this is going to be the same thing with this paradigm. You know, there's going to be people that use it as a general virtual assistant or a virtual chat bot that kind of manages their uh, calendars. But then there's going to be people that really take the technology to the next level and really up level their skill sets. And I, I, I encourage everyone here to, to be to be among the, the leaders 
leaders in the industry on this. And, and you know, what what's the role of the human? And, you know, I, I put some quotes here, especially, again, Andrew Ng and, and Fei-Fei Li, who are kind of thought experts on that. And, you know, AI at its core should still have the human as the center uh, centerpiece. And I, I like to think about AI as a right now as a first or, or a second year um, junior accountant or a junior financial analyst. They're really good. They're really smart. They're really hardworking. But you need to have human judgment in, in the model. You need to have human uh, thinking in order to review and make sure that uh, the data is correct and, and it makes sense. So, um, you know, a human will always be in the center of this. Um, and, you know, like I'm th saying, it's, it's, it's really going to be about robotic augmentation. So uh, building greater productivity uh, for us and for our teams. And, and you know, there's going to be that element of virtual assistance. Uh, people like the robots can kind of manage our day-to-day our -day tasks and manage our calendars uh, at, a, at a higher level. There's uh, elements of faster to competency that they can train us in. You know, I'm an expert on ASC 920, 926, which is content accounting, which is like the television content accounting, but I might not be an expert on ASC 606. So can uh, a robot get me up to speed where I have medium level of competency in a, in a, in a short period of time? It can do that today and, and it can help you today on, on these things. Um, you know, it can right now automate a huge amount of data, data entry tasks, invoicing, reconciliations, really augment our teams in order to have another team member on, on the team that is solely interested in data entry, manual work, and, and, and digging through documents. And so even our teams that are junior members, you know, they can now be reviewers of, of data, reviewers of the journal entries, and not the preparers of the junior entry, so uh, of the journal entry. So it moves everyone up a level so that they can focus on the more strategic benefits um, over, over the next, you know, years or so. Um, deeper understanding of the data and obviously the, the, the information these robots can go through are, are, are significant. They can dig through all of our data and they can kind of um, you know, parse it out and give us much better understanding. Uh, at the end of the day, I think all of us as, you know, finance and, and accounting leads, we want to be more strategic in nature and we want to influence the business. So uh, these robotic augmentation gives us the, the tools necessary uh, in order to do that. Um, and I, I wanted to give some practical guidance on, on generative AI and things that we're doing right now. And I, I know there's a question, uh, what are finance teams doing to prepare for, for 2024? And uh, I, I have some kind of concepts also that I, I'll, I'll show in the next slide of, of like very practical things that you can get 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 ready for for 2024 and 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 at the end of the day it's really about making data clean and 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 making sure that the data can flow through the the AI but um but before we get started on that um you know wanted to like just kind of touch base on um when to use generative AI and you know it's not yet intelligent uh it looks like it's intelligent it, it kind of emulates intelligence but you know, it's it's basically just predicting the next word, and it looks like it's coming up with a really good uh, story. But but it's not yet intelligent, so that's why you need a human to really review this information. Uh, when you come up with a problem that needs a solution, think about the problem. Don't just try to push uh, AI into every single problem uh, set. You know, like. AI is not appropriate for every problem set just yet. So, you know, I am guilty of this more than anyone of, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about generative AI. I, I I'm unlocking some of the tools, but not every nail needs an AI hammer. And, and sometimes it's overkill. And I don't want to uh, automate with AI just for AI's sake. I would like to uh, really think about the problem that's being solved and solve for that specific problem. Um, but that being said, you know, it's, it's up to us just uh, invest in time, start experimenting with it, start playing around, jump in that pool, iterate on that. 
Uh, a lot of great vendors out there, a lot of great solutions on the open market to play with and to 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 really analyze. And so this is a really exciting time in AI. Uh, two years, four years, five years, it, it, it could look completely different. Uh, when the iPhone came out or even a year before the iPhone, you know, probably no one really thought it could have, you know, Google Maps. Uh, maybe you thought they had Google Maps, but no one thought about Uber. No one thought about Airbnb and all these other giant businesses that built off of this paradigm shift of mobile. And there'll be the same paradigm shift with AI. And so uh, just get in front of it, learn from it, be flexible. Um, but be cautious, uh, you know, we want to make sure that uh, the data is safe. Um, you know, I think a lot of the data issues will be solved or have been solved by enterprise versions of, of the LLMs. And, you know, if we trust Azure or, or some of the other um, cloud-based kind of businesses with, with our data, we can probably, um, you know, assume that they'll be safe with with the the prompt data as well but you know that being said you know before you feed confidential information into any sort of llm you know uh, check with your data security teams check with your legal teams make sure that you guys are all everyone's confident that uh you are okay with sharing the data you're going to share but you know this over time will become um more and more common to share a lot of data just like you know in 2010 not a lot of companies shared a lot of data from from a cloud perspective because everyone was kind of afraid of pushing their information to the cloud and then eventually you know now everyone has, you know, is using gmail and google sheets and things like that all right so here's some practical guidance on specifically things that that we're working on or you know you can work on today with today's technology and and out of the box uh ai prompts and so um i i i really the my the focus of how i use it on a day-to-day -day basis is the accounting guidance and treatment side of of the business and all of these also are you know blank page problems by that i mean as accountants and finance leads, I, you know, I spend so much time writing memos. My team spends so much time writing memos. Sometimes it just takes a day or so just to kind of get my ideas out on a memo and then adjust it over time. So now a, a, a robot can kind of give us the guidance, give us the treatments, uh, write out a memo for us. And it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be great, but it's going to be good enough that we can adjust and make some changes to and tweaks and things like that. And, and over the next, the next slide also after is about prompt engineering through specific prompts, we can make this better and better and better over time. So um, really that accounting guidance and treatment, is, you know, is, is, is really what I focus my, my day to day on and, and it's revolutionized my workflow. And I, I'm really excited about that part of the process, uh, contract review and classifications. Um, again, make sure that your, your legal team and your data team are okay with feeding information, but you can throw in massive amounts of contracts into an LLM and it can give you specific guidance on each of those contracts. So think about, you know, all the steps that you need to do for, from 842 on leases or 606 on rev rec. Uh, it can, it can kind of go through each of those and, and understand what the guidance should be and how to account for it and, and kind of push into the next uh, workflow, those, those, those things. Um, it can go through the contracts, find embedded derivatives, find you know, out clauses to your deals, find nuances to the deals. And so you think about your teams and especially on the accounting side, we spend a lot of time just reading contracts or working with the legal team to read contracts. If a robot can go through and, and kind of point us where to read or the specific nuances of the contract saves immense amount of time. Uh, variance analysis, you know, I'm sure everyone on a quarterly or monthly basis has variance analysis that they have to have detailed uh, outputs for or, or uh, deliveries for. And it could be quarter over quarter of the balance sheet. It could be uh, the P&L versus forecast. 
the AI can also, you know, you might have 30 accounts that you need to do a variance analysis for. The, the AI can spit out a general version of that, that analysis. So that's still the, that blank page issue. Like it will come through just like a first year or second year junior accountant. It will populate the, the analysis and it's up to us with judgment and, and influence in order to kind of refine the comment. But you know, if, if it's about, you know, five products offset by five other project, uh, products that are down, uh, the, the AI is going to fly through that information. And what could take two days now takes 30 seconds. Um, AP and AR automations, a lot of different vendors have solved for this. Um, and, and there's a lot of great vendors out there to take a look at. But, uh, you know, think about the triple matching uh, policies and things like that. AI can do that much more from a natural language uh, process. So no longer do you have to have things at a very specific format, but it can be written as a human writes an email and it can read and, and ingest and understand that email and kick off the, kick off the next line of the, the automation. So it's, it's, it's going to revolutionize those pieces and automate a lot of those pieces. Um, drafting financial statements is something else that, you know, we as accountants take a lot of time to do. Now, even the notes can be drafted by an AI, again, at a very low level, and and, and we need to uh, kind of review it. But the AI can do this and then double check across the entire financial statements to make sure that it uh, it's all aligned. And then obviously automated uh, recon reconciliations. And you, we've probably had versions of this before, and there's like a lot of great vendors before. But again, now with natural language and it being able to understand how humans talk, uh, we can really accelerate automated reconciliations and not have to dig as deep into uh, actual journal entries in order to reconcile. So these are some of the things that that you know I I, I think we all can work on and. Uh, I want to build uh, an ecosystem of like-minded professionals that share ideas on how to use these AIs and things like that. So feel I put my email at the end of this uh, presentation. Feel free to reach out to me. Excited to talk about what everyone else is doing as well. But really, the the key on to make all of this successful is prompt engineering. It's a new concept that uh, we hadn't had before, but it's basically how do you tell the robot what to do? And, you know, it, it's the same as telling a first year graduate what to do. It's it's being clear, concise, specific, context aware and goal oriented. And so, you know, you could give it a prompt. Hey, what do I do with a lease, uh, you know, through Gap? And it can give you one answer. But if you can be more specific, the more specific you are, the better the output would be. So it in a scenario with a company that has a five-year lease of an office space, how should this be recorded on the balance sheet under ASC 842? It, it's going to be much more specific and give you exactly the answers uh, you want. So, uh, you know, learn about prompt engineering, learn how to guide the system. Currently, LLMs allow for 300 pages of, of prompts in order to uh, really get to the right information. Um, and so kind of learn from this and, and, you know, over the next couple of years, I think there's going to be a lot of tools on the prompt engineering side. And uh, again, <clears throat> the other really th exciting thing is just the democratization of, of the information itself. So now, you know, programming language of the future is going to be English. We can now program all of our information in 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 English, we can use the AI to to build apps for us. You know the constraint the constraint usually was you know data scientists and and product leads not having enough bandwidth. Now this opens up the bandwidth in order to uh, develop new systems, new processes for us as accountants and finance teams. And um, again, it's still early. Um, technology moves quickly, but organizations change slowly. I think, you know, we have a vision and we can see kind of where it goes. The, the, our companies will be slow to move, you know, but just take the time, uh, learn how to use the, the processes, jump in that pool, iterate, and let's, let's build an ecosystem and, and talk a little bit more, uh, about how to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. I put this slide here as like a, it's kind of funny in terms of 
um, the the power again of of AI. You know, I wanted someone jumping in the pool, but you can see uh, this guy has three legs. <laughs> the the AI doesn't know how to write words yet inside this specific uh, model, so it says you know it's misspelled. But you know, I think where the technology stands today is not indicative of where it will be a year from now, and it'll just keep on iterating over time. So. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, on this. Uh, I'm really excited to take some of your questions. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Brittany to, to ask some of the, the questions that have come through. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for such an incredible keynote. We did have quite a few questions come through, so we'll go ahead and look at some of those. Uh, this one question asks, how will AI tools or technologies be successfully taught to existing employees in an easy to understand manner? And will there be any continuing education on this? Yeah, I mean, the the goal is that we should all kind of think about kind of our work lives as, as, as continuing education. And I think we need to really focus on our teams and educate our teams, um, you know, it's it, it's interesting that we in in America or or just kind of in in culture we think of education differently than we think of our health, right? So like I think about hey, what if I was healthy through the age of twenty two and just never took care of myself again? You know, that's those are bad outcomes. But a lot of times, what we expect of our teams is you go through college and then then you work for sixty years, and and that's just not how life is evolving. The technology is moving so fast that we need to continually upgrade everyone's um, existing skill sets year after year after year. So yeah, definitely in, want businesses to be on the forth, forefront of thinking about educating their teams, especially about AI and even using AI services in order to educate your teams. Like I brought up earlier in the process, I don't know 842 as good as I know 926, but I can get up to speed by using some of these uh, services. So um, teaching our teams and and really inspiring our teams more than anything and, and creating that, uh, you know, the concept of, 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 of teams of excellence or innovative teams, that innovative mindset with our teams. Excellent. Thank you. This next question asks, um, it's my understanding that chat GPT is only updated through 2021. How would you use it to create a footnote for a new pronouncement if it doesn't have that data? Yeah, it's a great question. Now, uh, that's that's one of the problems with the LLMs is uh, the data is static. So the the data will be static at one point of time. Now, ChatGPT is now updated through April of 2023, but that's a great point is that's still static in terms of SEC pronouncement or, or FASB pronouncements. What you do is, so there's gonna be three different models for, for how businesses kind of have the most up-to-date information or the most relevant information. And basically, you know, a, a company could build their own LLM. That's way too expensive. Uh, you know, a billion dollars of cost. They can fine tune an open source LLM, which is, means like there's a foundational model and a lot of open source LLMs are out there. You fine tune it with the most relevant data. You fine tune it with all of your own data. And you can kind of think about it. Like I'm sure Deloitte and PwC and, and some of these other like accounting companies are fine tuning their models with all of the pronouncements, all of the guidance, all of the memos that they've written uh, so that it's a very specific model for accounting and finance. The last piece is in context learning, which is prompt engineering. And through there, you have 300 pages to load into the LLM to update the information so that it can spit out the natural language that would give you those, those, those ideas on new pronouncements. So basically what you can do is you can load the pronouncements, you can load different analysis of the pronouncements. If, if there's anything online or from, from your accounts that you can load in for that's a guidance perspective, you can feed in 300, 300 pages of information and documents and how other companies might've also used the pronouncements in their own notes. And then feed in your information and 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 give uh, a, a a new reflection of of those notes. So even though they're static in nature and they will always be static in nature because it just takes a lot of compute in order to build those foundational models. Uh, a it can also look to the internet for new relevant information, or you feed it the exact information you want it to have. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dan. That is all the time we have for questions, but we will be sure to share any that we didn't get to with you after this event. Uh, thank you again for such an incredible keynote presentation. I also want to thank everyone else who joined us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Thank you again, Dan.